What's up, guys? This is Derek, moreplaysmoredates.com. Today we're going to be talking about Ment or Trust Alone. Um, you might or might not have heard of it before. Um, it's not very well known. It's sort of like a next generation androgenic, anabolic androgenic steroid, but um, it's sort of become more mainstream in the past year in the bodybuilding community. But what I wanted to talk about today specifically is its potential application in hormone replacement therapy, especially for guys who are prone to male pattern baldness from the endogenous testosterone and DHT in their system. So as you may or may not know, uh, like basically this video is geared towards guys with similar mindsets to me in terms of their goals. So don't get it misconstrued that this is going to be talking about using trust alone for, you know, building huge amounts of muscle. Basically what my goal is at this point is to maintain what I have and replicate the same level of anabolism that my TRT accomplishes with a far lower degree of androgenic side effects. So basically, as you may or may not know, uh, testosterone um, has on paper a 100 to 100 anabolic to androgenic rating um, in actual practical use. It has a two to one selectivity for muscle tissue to prostate. So it's not very selective whatsoever, meaning it induces significant androgenic side effects like facial hair, hair, uh, hair follicle miniaturization, prostate growth, etc. And when it hits that 5-alpha reductase enzyme and converts to DHT, whatever amount of DHT is in your system is several fold more androgenic than that already circulating in your system testosterone. So mint or trust alone uh, doesn't go undergo a conversion to a more androgenic compound when it hits 5-alpha reductase. It's about the same level of androgenic activity in the body after it goes through that process. So using a 5-AR inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride doesn't make it any more hair safe. So basically, my experiment was what I've noticed throughout my years and you've probably noticed too, um, on paper, you know, there's the classic anabolic to energetic rating chart. And this chart shows, you know, how we would assume these compounds are going to work in the body, but it doesn't really hold true for most of them. Like if you go look at um, draw standalone on paper, if you go look at, uh, which is Masteron, if you go look at uh, um, Anavar, you go look at Winnie on paper the way they interact in the body is way different in real life application than it looks like on paper. So one thing, if you look on paper, Trestalone's androgenic rating is very high, very high. Like you would assume it would rip the hair out of your head. So, but one thing you have to consider and one thing I've considered greatly over the past year as I've started to delve into the research more is that some of these compounds bind harder to the androgen receptors. Some of them are stronger in general. Some are more suppressive. Some are such and such. They all have their kind of like own inherent ability to build muscle limited to kind of how potent of a compound they are to some extent. So like obviously, even though on paper, Trenblone looks five times stronger than testosterone, it's not like an actual practical application. 100 milligrams of trend equals 500 million milligrams of tests. Like it really doesn't work out like that. But even if something is very androgenic on paper, it's quite possible that despite it seemingly being worse for hair loss, the dosage at which it would induce the same amount of muscle retention could be a lower androgenic activity in the body than that amount of Testosterone, for example, that would be needed to achieve that level of anabolic activity in the body. So like hypothetically, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, testosterone, my TRT is 150 milligrams per week. Um, it's actually been lowered since then, since I've adopted a more frequent dosing protocol. I've noticed I can keep it stable and higher stable with no troughs with a more frequent pinning schedule, which is something... 
I would recommend speaking to your doctor about as well. If they have you doing very infrequent shots, you'll have big spikes and then big valleys where you basically will spike in your estrogen and have increased side effects by having a big bolus into your system at one time as opposed to having stable, consistently high normal levels. You know what I mean? So you could basically, what a lot of guys do is they'll blast themselves into a super physiological range in their blood serum concentrations. And then for like a week, they'll be operating at like medium or like borderline low levels. Not low, but like it's not stable whatsoever. And it leads to an increase in side effects, including shedding. So that's something to be noted as well. But before I get too off track, basically one thing I've realized is these things on paper, they're not, they don't really equate to how it works in real life application a lot of times. For example, some guys have a certain affinity to miniaturize to different androgens at different levels than other guys. So by that, I mean one, for example, just an actual real life example. I have several friends who are on dutasteride because they need to, or else they'll shed from even anything more than TRT testosterone. But for some reason, they can run Trenbolone and not lose their hair, which for a lot of guys would completely tear their hair to shreds. So, and there's a lot of other examples of different compounds too. Like some guys, they'll run like uh, Dianabol and have like no issues with hair loss. And then a lot of guys, they would run it and just like lose, you know, like 20% density from one cycle of it. And then another guy could run like a gram of test and have no issues with hair loss. And another guy could be on dutasteride, but run TRT and have shedding almost, but then run um, like uh, something more androgenic on paper, but not lose their hair. Like, I think regardless of these ratings on paper, I think there's something to do with an actual specific affinity for certain androgens that's individual specific based on your own genetic predispositions. So basically what I wanted to figure out Obviously, you can extrapolate from this what you will. But for me personally, I wanted to see if mint, if I have a higher affinity to miniaturize from mint or a lower than my TRT. Because there's been a lot of studies that have to do with, uh, not a lot, but there's been a, kind of a, you know, a conscious attempt to look at mint as a viable TRT alternative potentially in the future. And, uh, you know, obviously this interests me being somebody who's on TRT. So, um, in my kind of, uh, thought process, I'm thinking, well, you know, like I know I have several, several experiences of friends and personal experiences where things on paper didn't add up to how they really occur in real life. So if, even though ment is very androgenic, if there was a dosage that was, lower that would equate to the same level of anabolic activity in my body, but was less of an androgen load than my TRT is, or I simply didn't have an affinity to miniaturize from it for whatever reason, that's something I wanted to investigate. So what I did was I have a lot of backlog videos, by the way. So if some of these things seem like they're impossible to overlap without conflicting factors, like I just did my, I just posted my video about uh, my dutasteride experiments and dropping the RU. Um, like none of these things conflict with one another. Just no, a lot of these things happen over the span of like a year and a half. And I'm just getting around to posting them now because I've been <laughs> busy with other stuff. But basically, I say basically a lot. Sorry. Um, so I took out the TRT, the testosterone, and I replaced it with 70 milligrams of ment, trestolone, acetate. Um, Pinning every day 10 milligrams to keep blood serum concentrations as stable as humanly possible and assessing my shedding, my changes in shedding. Nothing changed in my hair loss prevention protocol just so I could assess what's going on accurately. Of course, I had to get off the RU. I was already off the RU for the first experiment, but I had to stay off of it to really assess what's going on at the androgen receptor and the hair follicles up here relative to the trestolone. Because if you have an anti-androgen competing with, you know, receptor binding 
it's not going to be an accurate representation of what this androgen is actually doing. So I used uh, the dosage I said, 10 milligrams a day, and assessed my shedding very, very closely. And what I concluded, for me personally, it's not hair safe at all. Um, I do think milligram for milligram, I think it's way stronger than testosterone for sure. Um, I noticed a bit of a boost in the gym, which indicated I could use a lower dose probably. Um, at the point that I got to, I didn't really want to continue to go as low as I could to see if I could get away with an even lower amount that would still replicate, you know, the anabolic activity of like a 150 per week or a 125 per week test dosage, just because I could already tell there was significant shedding occurring. Now that's for me personally, that doesn't mean that's going to apply for every single person out there, but hopefully, you know, a lot of guys, they want to know, does mint cause hair loss? How androgenic is it? How's it actually going to affect the body? Um, for me personally, it was not something that I think I could see myself using long term. Um, I don't think it's very hair safe at all. Um, one thing I do like about it though, is it fulfills a lot of the same physiological functions as testosterone, mostly because it also converts into estrogen, which I think a lot of guys don't realize. Um, when it comes to hormone replacement therapy alternatives, a lot of the time compounds that a lot of people talk about, you need to be on tests, like no matter what, and you need to be on test, nothing else replaces the same physiological benefits or functions that tests can fulfill. And I think a lot of these um, issues could be solved with, like this is all hypothetical, of course, and just my own like thinking, my own process. Um, a lot of these compounds that people are looking at for alternatives, they don't aromatize into estrogen. So if somebody was using like a hormone replacement therapy alternative that doesn't aromatize into estrogen, you would have zero estrogen circulating in your system because there's simply nothing converting into estrogen. And if you know, you know, your blood work, you'll know that crashed estrogen causes significant side effects. So I think a lot of the time, these kind of like theories going around about hormone replacement therapy alternatives aren't really considering the fact that there would be potential to research what goes on when you, when there's supplementation of exogenous estrogen in conjunction with whatever alternative is going to be used, assuming it doesn't convert to estrogen. But it just so happens that Trestolone on its own fulfills that, you know, in the body. So I think that's why a lot of guys, I think it's overlooked that that's probably why it's such a viable potential alternative, but um, something to be considered for sure. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, this video is kind of getting long. Sorry about that, but I don't think it's hair safe. That's for me personally, but just based on, like I'm sensitive to hair loss, so I think for a lot of guys, it'll probably be, you'll probably experience the same thing as me. And it just wasn't, it wasn't a good choice. So um, I'll probably rule it out in the future. And uh, TRT is still the go-to for me right now for the time being. So anyways, take from that what you will. I think it's a very androgenic compound that can, has a high affinity to miniaturize hair follicles. So. Um, as far as, you know, using it in, I can't say super physiological dosages because there's not really an established therapeutic level for Trestlone. It's not like there's a, a reference range that you can just say, oh, this is like, because the human body doesn't endogenously produce it. So it's not like you can say, this is where it's like safe and this is where it becomes like abusive. So I don't know if you're going to be using it for like bodybuilding purposes above and beyond I don't know what would be abusive der dosage territory range anyways, but I would, if you're prone to hair loss, I would expect that you're probably going to expedite your male pattern baldness. If you incorporate Trestolone, it's probably not a safe choice. Um, as far as inhibiting hair loss from it too, finasteride and dutasteride will do nothing because even if you inhibit that enzyme, you're there's nothing it's not converting into a more androgenic compound it's already inherently very androgenic prior to 5ar conversion and even after that there's it's not anything more or significantly less more androgenic i believe on paper it was like i forget what the metabolite is or whatever it converts into if anything it was like slightly more or slightly less but it was like negligible at most so 
don't expect to be preventing hair loss with finasteride if that's what you're incorporating into your protocols. So anyways, food for thought, just kind of an interesting topic because I see it on forums a lot. And I don't know if anyone's really experimented with like very, very, I would say micro doses because I think that would be like considered low to most people. But anyway, 70 a week, not hair safe for me. Might be for you, but who knows? I don't recommend it. Not medical advice, blah, blah, blah disclaimer. Um, just some some random guy on YouTube. Don't take, you know, anything, as I say, as misconstrue it as medical advice because it's just me talking about my own personal experiences and it's no replacement for, you know, doctor supervision or your physician's advice or anything like that. Talk to him about your TRT regimen. Just me detailing my own experiences and random random finding so anyways thank you guys for watching please like subscribe check out my blog more plates more days.com talk to you guys soon